Hey, I've got a hell of a story for you today. Uh, I have Mark Ruff here. Uh, he's the guy, one of the two guys that ejected from the MiG-23 at the Detroit Air Show. And we're going to talk about that today. And I think we're going to learn a lot. So stick with me on Flywire. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today uh, we're going to talk to Mark Ruff about his ejection in the MiG-23 at the Detroit Air Show, and uh, we're going to get into real good depth on that. And he's got a hell of a story, and I want to get to it, but I think there's some background information that uh, we need before we start, because if you've never flown uh, a supersonic fighter, a modern fighter, say, made after the 60s, 1960s, then I, I, I think you don't have the frame of reference to really understand what uh, environment we're talking about. Uh, you fly in a Mooney, you're flying an airplane like this, or a Husky, uh, you're flying even an L-39, frankly, or a, a Bizjet, it's not the same. It is just isn't. So I wanna talk about that. For, so I think most of y'all probably know that I flew the F-4 and the F-15E. Uh, so uh, the F-15, start off with the F-4. Uh, you know, the, it's a heavy airplane. Um, you know, I had slept since uh, I used to know all the answers uh, from the Dash 1 on that, but as my I remember, it's uh, eh, 20, 25,000 pounds empty and something less than 40 full uh, and carry a little bit of external stores. Uh, but there's inertial effects when you're talking about an airplane that heavy. It had 12,000 pounds of fuel. For some reason that I remember that. But uh, uh, internal. So the F-15, on the other hand, um, weighed just under 30,000 pounds empty, the F-15E that I flew, and it could weigh as much as 81,000 pounds-ish with stores. So an enormous difference. And the size of the uh, F-15E is actually about the MD-80. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, we used to call it flying tennis court, or Rodan the Destroyer, you know. I had a big radar, and I don't care. If you see me, screw that stealth shit, because I'm going to shoot your ass down. What I want to talk about is that the, the, the difference in a supersonic fighter, okay, the amount of weight. So uh, for those of that you have flown the T-6, or you can understand this, um, a T-6 does all the tail dragger stuff that a, a Husky does, or a Cub, or a Super Cub, or something like that does. But it weighs in at about 5,200 pounds. So it's over two times as heavy. So inertia is a factor in that airplane and it will get you in trouble on landing uh, in particular, uh, or, or in the stalls, and it's a problem. So um, everywhere you go in an F-4 or an F-15, virtually any fighter, you're doing 300 knots. And that's just, uh, yeah, I can maneuver not super well at 300 knots, but I can maneuver. I've got options at 300 knots. At 200 knots, ooh, I'm, not, oh, I'm not happy there. Uh, that's getting close to, I better be configured and landing and I'm, I'm doing all that stuff because below 200 knots, if I'm in an air-to-air -air fight, uh, I'm going to have to have some altitude to sort all this out because when I get down to the ground and you grovel at the ground, eh, stall is uh, uh, something that takes a lot of altitude to recover from. Uh, and uh, you don't never spin these airplanes. Um, accelerated stall, you spend a lot of time in that. How you maneuver an airplane like this, a swept wing fighter, is by amount of buffet you get, okay? And that buffet is uh, just what you think it might be. It's the angle of attack is reaching a critical point and you're starting to get separation, okay? So this airplane does a buffet too, but it's not the same. It's a buffet right before the break. And a swept wing fighter, the buffet has got a fairly large window until the elephants are dancing on your wings and that's when you're about to stall. So you'd spend a lot of time learning how, what your energy state is by feeling the buffet when you're turning, so you don't have to look inside at the, out, the uh, airspeed indicator. You're turning and you're looking at somebody because you gotta keep the tally on somebody because he's gonna kill you. And if you look at the airspeed, where is he again? Uh, that's all bad. So, uh, normal stalls, you know, you practice them in, in uh, training, but you don't do those necessarily. They're not one G. Uh, out of control. I want to mention this as we start. In the Air Force, we had an out of control floor. Is if you were out of control, you departed the airplane, you get out at 10,000 feet. No talk, no, dis no discussion. And as a matter of fact, I've got a friend 
who uh, departed in F-4, and he was below 10,000 feet. He recovered the airplane with the drag chute and landed with it streaming. And they shit all over him because he didn't eject uh, when he was out of control. Mm -hmm. I mean, he succeeded and saved the airplane. Okay. But he risked his life doing that. Uh, he was fortunate to have do that, but he risked his life doing that. So 10,000 feet, I believe the S-16s use 6,000 feet for an out-of-control number. I didn't fly the Viper, so I don't know, but uh, uh, so that's that. And for an in-control situation, in other words, I can fly the airplane, but it's not going anywhere, uh, it's 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet, I don't want to get out. That gives you time, as particularly in an F-4 and F-15, which is a dual-seat uh, airplane, for the seat se sequence to work and you to get uh, one to two swings in the chute before you hit the ground. If you have a problem, like you have to do a manual seat separation, you need altitude to do that. Okay, you gotta understand that as we go here. So 2,000 feet is the in control altitude. Below that, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you better be out of the airplane. And as a matter of fact, as I remember uh, when I was in, they had a, uh, a very experienced F-16 guy, I think it was a Lieutenant Colonel, who stayed with the airplane, I'm gonna save it, I'm gonna get that engine going, and he ejected at 600 feet, and I think minor injuries, uh, but they shit all over him, because he should have gotten out at two. The, the engine wasn't running. So uh, that's it. The, uh, and the, it, I can't say enough about the inertia effects. So, you know, you fly a little airplane, and you're making a turn, or you're, say you're doing a dive recovery, um, you can t you can actually uh, you have inertial effects, but they're not that big relation to your uh, your uh, your performance. So in a in a fighter, they actually uh, talk about dive recoveries and how much altitude you're going to lose because during the recovery, when you're doing this, your vector is actually still down until you start climbing away. You know your your uh, vector, the flight path vector, is down until you can fix that. And that's all due to how much you weigh. It, you know, it doesn't matter how much thrust you have. Uh, you might overcome that inertial effect a little faster with more thrust, but it's still a real thing. And if you don't understand inertia, well, frankly, I'm not sure unless, unless you've flown that kind of airplane, you really get a picture of what inertia is about. It's not this, not the Bonanza. Uh, so the, the weight, by the way, we'll talk about that really quick. The weight difference is this airplane, empty, is uh, just over 2,100 pounds. That's about emergency fuel for an F-15. This airplane. <laughs> and that's, that's a big deal. All right, so, uh, and then there's, uh, uh, the other thing is uh, crew coordination. So in a two-seat airplane, it's actually a crew. Um, it, typically, the way the Air Force flies, in Vietnam, they actually put pilots in the back seat call it the, you know, the, the guy in back. Uh, you'd start off as a pilot, they'd, you'd start off in the back and you'd have so many sorties and then you'd go to you'd do a front seat upgrade. But uh, very quickly they changed to where they used WIZOs, weapon systems officers who are navigators that learned how to fly uh, in fighters. And uh, they didn't really do much navigating anymore, they do more systems operation, radar, things like this. And, uh, but uh, the critical thing here is is that the Back seater is an integral part of the crew, and he's actually his. One of the big tasks he has is uh, situational awareness, because if you're flying the airplane, sometimes you get really wrapped up in that, and you do, you tend to lose your situational awareness about what else is going on. So it's a very important part of what's going on. And with that, uh, now that we have a little bit of a background, I think uh, we're gonna. We might inter I might interrupt him. I, I sure. reserve the right. But I want to I want to have Mark tell us his story uh, about uh, about the ejection sequence. So how did it okay. the whole thing? How did it start? Thank you, Scott. I am thankful to be alive, and I'm thankful to be with you. I'm happy you're here. Tell us okay. what you saw on August 13th. A friend of mine that uh, owns a MiG-23 asked me if I would help him and be a safety observer while he did some flying at an air show up in uh, Michigan at uh, Ypsilanti, the Thunder Over Michigan Air Show. Um, I said yes, and uh, we had a couple of great flights, and then uh, during our last flight, I uh, had an engine failure, 
where the engine rolled back to idle and got stuck in a zero thrust setting at the worst possible time. And we worked together to try and solve the problem as best we could, and then we ran out of time, and I made the decision to eject us both from the aircraft. There's more to this story, so let's dig into it now. So um, the way I've explained it is uh, going back about, uh, I don't know, 15 flights or so um, with the airplane, um, and the owner had asked me to help him uh, with the airplane. Um, so going back about 15 flights, um, the airplane had been flying very well. So minimal uh, maintenance requirements. So put fuel in it, put nitrogen in it, uh, check the engine oil, hydraulics. Everything was, was working pretty well. There was a canopy issue. The canopy blew off um, in, uh, in, I think, the overhead pattern in Oshkosh at the air show there. I wasn't in the aircraft. I wasn't there. I was at, at home in Texas. Um, but uh, there was a, another backseat pilot um, on that. Um, uh, point of, uh, uh, is was it the canopy or was it one of the side windows? Uh, sorry, it was the front right side window. You're absolutely correct. Okay. However, it was able to be repaired and new seals put in and it uh, did great. Um, so about two weeks later, um, the air show is, uh, is going on up in um, Willow Run, up in Michigan. And uh, Dan had asked me to help him out again. Um, the aircraft owner had asked me to help him out again. Um, so uh, we flew a couple of times uh, at the show. In that morning, we flew with uh, Marines, the uh, F-35s, and it was a great flight. And the Marines are incredible. Um, and uh, we just went north to Amoa um, and did just a little bit of air work and then came back. Um, then, and again, the airplane was doing great. Um, uh, the owners, amazing maintainer, uh, brought the fuel up to 3,000 liters, um, which is about three quarters of a tank, because um, that was all we're going to need. The air show wanted 12 minutes of flying or so in the afternoon air show. I think we were the second to last act to fly. Uh, did engine start, taxi out, everything was normal. Uh, did an afterburner takeoff and then climbed to the right. So yeah, so, so we went around to the north and came and got set up for a 45 degree wing sweep banana pass so that the photographers can see the top of the jet. Um, and it makes for just nice photography and a, a nice experience for the crowd. So um, with the wings at 45 degrees, we need to be going significantly faster than the wings at 16 degrees. It's, it's quite an increase um, to give you that extra stall margin um, to make sure you're flying in the middle of the flight envelope uh, for the wings at, at that angle. Um, so at the time when he normally would light the afterburner, I said, uh, you know, light the burner. And it takes a couple of seconds for it to light. And also it takes a couple of seconds for it to come out of afterburner when you've selected it back out. Mm -hmm. So I see the throttle move forward, but the afterburner doesn't light. There's no kick, there's no acceleration that you feel in your chest when, when you're in afterburner in, in the MiG. And so uh, I s So you were, you, were, you were getting ready to go to afterburner so you can get the speed. And what speed was your target? Um, target Four, would have been 450? Yeah, uh, 350 to 400. Okay, so you didn't get that. You were what speed when you started? Uh, maybe 310, 320. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, so no acceleration, and then I see the throttle come back. I see it come all the way to idle and then back forward, back into the afterburner range, still no light. And then the engine RPM starts to decay. So it is starting to, to unwind, and you feel that deceleration. And that's when I said, we need the wings to 16. I said, we've got a problem. He said, yep. But the prelim actually said that uh, the pilot uh, moved the wings to 16 degrees. Yes, and that's, that's not correct. But you have to understand, you have to give it the context of, of that situation. So, when, the, when the NTSB guys talked correct, to you. Correct, correct. Uh, two representatives from the FAA uh, came into our hospital rooms. And this is 90 minutes to two hours after ejecting from the airplane and wanted to record some statements and conduct an interview. Um, so you have to keep in mind that for both of us, our backs are broken. Um, we've been through an incredible life-changing event. Um, there is a lot of unknown and tension. Uh, we're on heavy medications. Uh, we're in extreme pain. And it was a hazy time in general. So there's a lot going on in a person's mind in that situation. So orienting and organizing the data bits is, that's just, that's not a, a valuable time to be 
to be organized. Well, I can, I can imagine, and you're probably a bit distracted. They're probably talking about surgery and, yes. you know, and you have no idea what the prognosis is. How bad is your back broken? Correct. Had been in for scans and in for x-rays, but was waiting for the neurology team to decide uh, when we would go into surgery, what time, uh, if we even need surgery. Uh, they were going to debate on the best path forward for us health-wise. He said something about it could be the nozzle. Um, there's a procedure if you have an emergency when you need to close the nozzle. Um, he might have started that. Um, but then we needed to come left because we were planning on getting set up for uh, a banana pass continuously on the south side of the airport, down runway 23. Uh, and the show boss had approved that, so, so we went to the left. Um, we had drifted up climb-wise a little bit, but I'm start, I start calling out air speeds as the air speed is now bleeding down below 250 knots, below 220 knots. And we got into a little bit of that buffet that you, you talked about elephants on the, on the wing, the airplane's rumbling. Right? Yeah, they're and dancing, they're just kind of dancing, they're on their toes. That means mm -hmm. you're up performing, but at the, the, that's the airway break. Mm -hmm. It's Correct. progressing up the wing. Yes, so the, the air is no longer normalized over the top. It is starting to separate. Um, and I said, Dan, we need flaps. I said to the owner, we need flaps now. And, and he, he had control of those. He has control. So the, in the back seat, uh, you move trim, flaps. You, there are some controls that you move forward to the front seat and to the back seat so that only one person can command them at any given time. Um, and he agreed, so he selected flaps to take off. I can look out over the wing and I can see the slats come in and there's little notches across the top of the wing when the flap is down that stick up. They're just pieces that go forward of the hinge so they stick up a little bit. So I think, okay, that's gonna buy us a little bit of time. The speed continues to decay. So now it's progressing down to 190, 180. And your altitude? Our altitude. Um, he's having to trade. He felt the buffet too. So he's having to lower the nose to trade. So our altitude is now decreasing. I would say 800 AGL or, or less. Um, and as that's happening, uh, there's discussion of, can we make it to runway 27? I said, no, because 27 is on the north side of the airport. And we're on the south side, and we're several miles south of the airport. Um, there's the Class D airspace was the, up to 16,000 was the airspace for the air show, and we needed to stay inside that anyways. So we're planning to stay inside that, but then all of a sudden we're in an energy deficient situation. Um, and again, he's got checklist items he might memorize. He's trying to run things up front, but our speed continues to decay. I keep calling that out. Um, and I said, we need flaps full. He agreed, selected flaps to full. So now they've tracked all the way out. At this point, we have cashed in our energy. Either we get the engine back, and I mean roaring back, and then we can level off, and then we can clean up, which is retract flaps, accelerate, get on the front side, and then climb up. And then at that point, you would want to go to the uh, high key, essentially, for a simulated flame out, which would be 16,000, 17,000 feet above the airport. Um, I was able to get an emergency call out, so I was able to say the, uh, the show boss didn't want tail numbers, um, wanted the air, airplane type, the aircraft type, Typical. And, and whatever you needed. So it was MiG-23 emergency. Um, and then the show boss came back and said, MiG-23, state the nature of your emergency. Um, I didn't have time. There was no, it, it, it wouldn't help. We had, we had a handful of airplanes and, and we're doing our best. Exactly. So at this can, point, we're now trading. You, do you think, what altitude do you think we're here at that point? Um, at that point, we are now basically in a left turn on the south side of the airspace, descending through maybe 700, 600 AGL, right? So we're trading. Um, altitude to preserve the airspeed that we have left, um, which isn't much, so 180 knots or less. Um, I asked what's in front, and he said, apartments, I'm coming left, something to that effect. Starts to come left, and I said, we're going to have to get out. There was some silence. He might have said something, might have mumbled something. I'm not absolutely sure. And then we got back into the buffet, so the airplane is now rumbling. So the nose is up, but our flight path vector is coming down. And that's that angle of attack split. And that's when, and you feel that it's not a ground rush, but you're just aware that, that the things in your peripheral vision are getting higher. They're coming up this way. They're coming up this way. Yeah. And that's when I said, eject, eject, eject. And I grabbed and squeezed the pistol grips. You rotated the elbows. And that's when the sequence started. And 
it is an intense amount of violence. It is hard to understate. Uh, the KM1 seat is an amazing seat. Um, I am so glad that it exists and that the excellent professionals put the charges in correctly and that the excellent professionals maintain that seat the way that it was. Um, because of its design era, it's not a zero-zero seat. Um, you need forward speed if you're on the ground with no downward vector. Once you're in the air, then you can look at different charts about sink rate or descent rate um, and angle if you're going to be ejecting to the side. But it's a very smart seat. They, they really designed it well. Um, it's tied in static to the airplane's static system. So it is hardwired and it knows your pressure altitude. Um, and that helps because the seat was designed to be operated down at low altitude and also up at 60,000 feet and Mach 2. So it needs to be a sophisticated enough seat to, if you eject at 60,000 feet, have you fall in your seat to a lower altitude where there's breathable air, where your parachute will work, where you will not freeze to death, all of those things, and then run its sequence. So there are timers. So I, I grab the handles, I pull it, it hits the initiator, and the sequence is front canopy, back canopy, back seat, front seat. Way faster than the way that I just, the time it took me for you ex to explain that. So. The initiator, I wasn't prepared for it to come out, but it, it came out and it's in my hands and the canopy goes over and then my canopy goes. There are these pieces on the side, these plungers that pop up and it goes and the airstream just takes the canopy and, and causes it to clear. There's a lanyard at the back. It did its job. When the canopy got clear, it pulls the lanyard telling the seat, I'm clear, you're good to go. Right? Then another series of events happen. These restraints in front that you put your legs into without even, I mean, you know them, you notice them, they're, they're there, I don't know, trained on them, but um, they immediately grab your legs, your shins, and pull them back into these cups at the base of the seat that are designed to prevent flailing injuries, because again, it's designed for, to keep you alive at Mach 2, and the airstream at Mach 2 must be incredibly violent, right? So it puts your legs in there, and I still have uh, wounds, you can see a bruise there, and uh, and the, the scab yeah, from, yeah, good cut from, there. Yeah, yeah. from the res restraints grabbing. But they pull back and then I'm brought back into the seat, right? Uh, a series of charges fire. I go up a telescoping pole on rails in the seat. Um, and by the time I'm up at the top, the main uh, rocket is firing. And it has vents that go out to the side that I think are designed to stabilize you, right? So now I am in 200 mile an hour air so at 180 knots, that equates to about 200 miles an hour, maybe 170 knots, maybe, maybe 190 miles an hour of air. Um, but I go into the air and that blast, and then I'm going however many 100 miles an hour straight up. And the way I describe it to people is air at those speeds going from no airspeed in, in the cockpit to up and forward at those speeds is, it is like being pulled behind a boat underwater. If you've ever been water skiing and holding onto a rope and the, the boat takes off, solid, yeah. it just, it pulls on you. Um, these side pieces came down when my leg restraints came in. I've still got an awesome bruise on the back of my left arm. It hit that on the way down, but my head was pulled down and I'm looking down as it just boom and the airplane goes away. And I'm in, I was in a brown, a cloud of brown uh, smoke for a while and orange, but the orange might have just been the the rockets reflecting off the, off the smoke, but I was bathed in this blast. And so I get propelled up. And you know, the way I describe it to people, when we were out of energy and we were out of options, so couldn't lower the nose to pick up airspeed because then your sink rate's coming down. The engine is stuck at zero thrust. Um, so it's not helping at all. Um, and you have no more no more pitch up because we are, we are stalling, yeah. right? And we're in a left bank, so we're ejecting to the side. And that was when, once I pulled the handle, this sequence happens and you go from that time compression of our communication back and forth from front seat to back seat. Uh, there was no cussing, no swearing, no elevated. It was very matter of fact. Um, he is an excellent pilot, an excellent aviator, and it was just very much trying to handle one thing at a time. So. So the, the seat does its job and um, 
the, the timing was exactly what it should have been. It knew low altitude ejection, I'm putting you on the low altitude sequence. So as far as the timing goes, it was, uh, you know, canopy, restraints, seat, main rocket, stabilizing drogue, I tumbled, um, and so did the, the owner, he tumbled, and the stabilizing drogue for just a second, and then that streamlines me, and then man seat separation, and then full main chute deployment. And that opening shock was also very um, violent. So I have some awesome bruises. I've seen colors on my skin I didn't know were possible. Greens, yellows, blacks, purples. Um, so on my body there. And at that point, I am now under a chute, and I come to a stop and swing down. And I look up, and I see the orange and white. And I look to my left down below, and then I see that the, the owner has an orange and white good chute. And the airplane has rolled off to the left and is knife edge pass going into the ground up beyond some trees in what looked to me like an open field, but I, there were roofs around. And I know now, I guess it's a defunct golf course that, that hadn't been maintained for a while. And we got so lucky that it went where it went. Um, so, but that, and then the fireball and the black smoke going up. You transition to now almost silence, right? I'm descending in this chute at a high speed, but with the air mass that's moving, no wind. So I'm descending and I realize I'm gonna be in the lake. I can hear boats and people yelling, right? I hear engines. So I hit the water and I mean, I went deep. I come back up, <gasps> you get that breath of air. And then the harness and the chute that weigh 40 pounds on dry land, it's getting heavy. Trying to kill you. <laughs> and my boots are full of water. I'm still wearing my gloves. My flight suit, everything is now drenched and I realize it's gonna drown me. Mm -hmm. I end up going back under and was able to get to my emergency release. It, luckily, it only takes one hand to do it. Um, but I get to my emergency release, my harness falls away and then I'm able to swim out underneath and get to the surface, <gasps> air again. And then I realize, I'm gonna make it. And I look back to my left and there's a boat coming at full speed. And I think to myself, my hair is wet. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, they're gonna hit me. <laughs> and so I start to swim back towards my uh, orange and white parachute. And, uh, cause I'm thinking they're gonna see that and not hit it. And the boat comes to a stop and these awesome people say, are you okay? I said, yes, do you need help? Yes. <laughs> So I swim around at the back of the boat and they helped me up onto the platform and I was able to say, uh, my back is broken, we need to get to a hospital. Um, and then another boat comes up and they say, we've got your buddy. And I just, that I was quite a relief in that respect. So uh, police, uh, just a single uh, uh, police officer on a boat, small boat marked police pulls up and is yelling, Take them to that dock. That's the whatever apartment's dock. Um, the EMTs will be here in a few minutes. So I've got blood coming down my face. Um, I've got a, a little bit of back pain, back pain, but my adrenaline is still through the roof. Um, and the first pain that I got was on the left side of my arm and on the left side of my leg. Um, at that point on the dock, I'm able to, to meet up with the owner and we're able to make our way up to a gazebo um, where we sit and just have a, a second to just, wow. Um, the horror for me is the black smoke, the papers fluttering down through the air. I was wearing a knee board, it was gone. Um, you know, checklist, uh, helmet bag, everything went flying when, when we ejected. So at that point now we're waiting for the ambulance and I was able to get some text messages out my cell phone, I had flown with it shoved down between my undershirt and my flight suit, like lapel or whatever you call that side. And it had worked its way in the ejection all the way down to my right boot. It survived the water, it survived on the dock, because I realized, what is that down there? I, I fish it out and I hit the button on it and it comes up with the time, you know, how can I help you? And so I was able to get a couple of messages out to uh, my two sisters, my brother, um, and it was engine failure, we had to eject, we're okay, headed to the hospital, let me know if there's any news. Because at that point you realize 
the airplane could have injured or killed people on the ground. Right. And that tension, that horror is another thing that is hard to put into words. So an ambulance arrives and they want to split us up and take us in separate ambulances. We're okay in, in that respect. We want to be in the same ambulance. And so the owner and myself are sitting next to each other and uh, his phone was smashed uh, in, the, in the sequence and uh, he realizes that. And uh, so I said, give me your wife's number and I'll, I'll text her that, that you're okay. It's important for her to hear it from me and from you rather than you know, hours from now from the media. Absolutely. So uh, I'm looking down and I see the dust and scorch patterns on our flight suits are identical. It's the KM1 seat and that's what it does. It doesn't need electricity. It works well, it lasts a long time, but it'll break your back. Um, he had his sleeves up and no gloves, so he was singed, uh, just like it looked like sunburn, and had no, no hair. It was burned off. Yeah, it's kind um, of a Navy thing is, you know, you, you don't wear gloves and you roll your sleeves up because it looks cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It was a very hot day, but, but yeah, so, yeah. So, so at that point, we're on our way to the hospital, and our outstanding maintainer is calling me, and so I'm able to answer and explain and I get from the EMTs what hospital are we going to give him that information um, and then my phone starts ringing from some of my friends uh, and friends from work in particular and I answer and they say uh, oh thank god it wasn't you and I said no no it, it was me I, I'm okay I think my back's broken uh, but we're headed to the hospital I'll call you later you know and then I hang up and if you could have elevator music in an ambulance I mean, it just was do 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 <laughs> Like Jeopardy. And it just, it was the strangest, horrible experience. Um, but we, we um, again, my, my phone rings again, and I answer that one. Thank God it wasn't you. It was me. We're headed to the hospital. And I, I asked that friend, let me know if you hear anything, if there's anything on the media about injuries or whatever, because, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big, it's a heavy thing. Um, and he said, absolutely, I'll let you know, okay. Um, so, uh, so we get to the hospital and we get processed in and uh, the staff there is incredible. They are, uh, they are truly just heroes. They, they work crazy hours, they deal with awful, terrible things and they do it with skill and dedication and um, they had, the, everyone I worked with had a way about them that was just top notch and I just, Anybody having a health crisis or whatever, that's a place where you want to be. So um, I'm explaining to them our injuries. I'm like saying, please, we need x-rays, uh, CT scans. We're messed up. Um, and they're, okay, sure, you take it down. Because we didn't look, I mean, other than blood down the face and those kinds of things, I don't think we looked that bad. I'm sure they don't get um, many ejections. They, you know? <laughs> they How do we deal with that? Car wrecks, those sorts of things, yes. Um, so uh, the... ER doctors order some scans and we get that, get that going. Um, and uh, that was when a uh, law enforcement person came in, uh, needed to verify my identity, and they were very gracious in how they went about it. They said, you've been through an event, we, look, I just need to verify who you are. Um, so I did, and I uh, said, you know, my, my ID is in the front left pocket of my drenched flight suit, it's right over there. Um, they verify it, and I said, what do you know about the scene, what do you know about he said, I was dispatched right here, so I don't, I don't have any information, but uh, let me make some calls. So he steps into the hallway, and then uh, about 30 minutes later, uh, I'm dealing with other folks. They've got an IV going and all those things. Um, 30 minutes later or so, uh, two law enforcement folks come in, and uh, they interrupt the, the tech, and they said, just want to let you know, just got off the phone. No fatalities no injuries, no damage to any structures. And that was the first time I got emotional. And that was when it just... Yeah, when you're able actually to release, you know, not to have it all pinned up. Yep, yep, yeah. and that's when you know it's, it's gonna be okay. Because yeah. um, prior to that, uh, you just, the unknowns and, yeah. and, the, and the possibilities. So, and uh, you know, we're not curing cancer. We love what we do, um, and I love the history of it, and, and sharing it with the public and I love uh, the educational aspect 
and the Cold War history, and I don't want it to be lost. Um, so many people dedicated their lives uh, to that, that you know, multi-decade struggle. And this is a bit of living history that gets to go flying around, and the public gets to interact with it, and there's something so cool, and I love that. Um, but, but we're not the heroes at the hospital, we're not those people at the hospital that are, that are actually truly sacrificing so much for others. That's, that's such an awesome thing to be, to be a part of. So once I, once I knew that, then it was, it was a relief. It was a weight yeah. off of me. Um, and then uh, amazing maintainer came in and uh, asked me how my back was, and I, I explained. Um, I gave him a fist bump. I said, You're, you are my ejection seat guy the rest of my life. Not so sure about engines, but, <laughs> but ejection seats, yes, yeah. you are, you are yeah. the guy. Um, that's pretty incredible. That's an incredible story. The Martin Baker seat we had in the F4, we used to say it required 12 consecutive miracles for it to work. Mm -hmm. Instead of having uh, uh, structure to drag your, your legs in, what we had was uh, gaiters. We wore these, uh, th which are basically uh, these snaps that go around your uh, knee here and around your ankle. Mm -hmm. And it was a, uh, a nylon rope, basically, mm -hmm. that went to the floor. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in that airplane, the uh, ejection wasn't back, leaned back very much. So if you didn't have those uh, gaiters to pull your legs in, mm -hmm. you'd lose your knees. Sure. Because the uh, dash. dash would just cut right off. Mm -hmm. So as it, it's really interesting how it would work is you pull the handles, either one. We had uh, command sequence, uh, so the back seat could choose to eject both people or just himself. Mm -hmm. The front seat would eject both people. Mm -hmm. So the F4 seat is a 130 knot seat. You had to be doing at least 130 knots and uh, no sink rate. Okay, so uh, basically you can't do it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, your the KM1 seat is an 85 knot seat. Correct. Yeah, it's 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 in kilometers per hour, but yes, it equates to about 85 knots. Yeah, and I would bet it's probably in the range in the same thing where it was not really a sink rate. It won't uh, tolerate sink. much of a sink rate, yeah. and it's not gyro stabilized or anything like that. It won't. If you come out sideways, you come out sideways. Come out sideways. It's, uh, it's a very, it's it's a seat of that era. Yeah. Um, so it's very reliable. They downloaded it into the MiG-21 um, because they were so happy with it, and into the Tu-22 bomber. Hmm. So, Interesting. modified well, a little bit, and, so the, the, and then MiG-25. Yeah, the F-4 rocket, <clears throat> it's got a gun charge, basically, mm -hmm. that uh, blasts it out of the airplane and the rocket starts. So um, they modified them at some point, I don't, can't remember when, uh, where it was just one charge that got you out, but they had a lot of spine problems, mm -hmm. so they had an auxiliary. Mm -hmm. So one charge that would start you going, and another one then would light up, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't be all just one compression sure. yeah, on all, all your vertebrae. Because uh, they had a lot of problems with those seats er mm -hmm. for earlier jets. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and both the owner and myself have compression fractures on our spine, on our vertebrae. Um, yeah. So it's, they're identical injuries, and that's, again, that's the downside. That's, that, the that, that's yeah. what the seat, you, you accept that um, when, you, when you fly an airplane with an, a hot seat like that. Um, but, uh, again, the, the reliability is what you gain. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's good. The ACs but you too, have to be in the envelope. You have to and be in the envelope, and that's the important part. And that's what I want yeah. to talk talk about in this video <clears> now. <throat> is I want to talk about envelopes mm -hmm. um, for all of this stuff as it happened. This is you know your real experience, but I want to talk about envelopes and decision making mm -hmm. because I think that's a real big factor. The F-15 seat, by the way, is called the Aces Two, and it was a zero zero seat. So you could be at zero speed, zero altitude on the ground, you can eject and you'll still get a man seat separation and a chute. Okay. Yes, and an excellent uh, video of a modern seat functioning at essentially zero, zero is the recent ejection of the uh, um, F-35B over at, uh, at the NAS Joint Reserve Base Fort Worth over at Carswell. Um, where I think mm -hmm. it was a, a test pilot or it might have been a contractor, might have been military, but... Yeah, he was bouncing, he had a bouncing on a, a vertical and, landing And kind realized of thing. it's going to roll the over nose, him. He was going to do this and he bails out, or mm -hmm. he pulls punches mm -hmm. out there. And that's an yeah. incredible seat. I, I wish we could, could download those seats, could retrofit them into some of these other aircraft, but, uh, but you have to accept what's there. And I was trained on the, uh, the Mark 10, Martin Baker seat, I think it was the Mark 10, um, and a Northrop seat, um, and the, uh, the seat that's in uh, L-39s. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they, you just have to know the parameters. So, uh, civilian-owned aircraft that have ejection seats, they have a pretty, pretty bad record 
um, for seat activation and mm -hmm. fatal accidents because it's, it's the delayed decision making and then it is activating the seat outside of the parameters. That can be sync rate, that can be speed, that can be angle, it can be a lot of different things. But there have been some tragic accidents where the seat worked, it just, it was outside of its envelope so it couldn't deliver. Couldn't um, deliver, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's one of the things we talked about, that sync rate issue is the inertia situation is mm -hmm. in, uh, the so the uh, Asus 2 is a little better for sync rate but I still you know for some reason something like two to three thousand feet per minute I don't I can remember something like that mm -hmm. uh, was the uh, was the limit so in other words mm -hmm. you could have some sync rate but not a lot and uh, in your situation I would bet you you were somewhere between 1500 and 3000 feet per minute decent rate Correct, and when you're in that burble and the nose is pitched up and the airplane is telling you, I don't have anything left to give you. Um, so the, the airplane was in a stall, it was stalling in a little bit of a bank, um, and as the nose comes down, so I was able to get a positive vector with the seat up, away from both the ground and the airplane, but as it pitches down just enough, the owner's seat ends up firing him forward and if you look at the video, particularly video from the lake, shot from the lake, uh, by the time man seat separation happens for him and his chute inflates, by the time he gets a full chute, that mm -hmm. opening shock with that main deceleration, he's at treetop level. He's at treetop level. So what it tells me is when I hear your story and I think about it, I think you were at the very bottom end of survivable ejection. Two of my friends that are experts in this said two to three seconds. Yeah. That was it. And uh, I, I, uh, the, the flaps, when you put the flaps out to full, I think that actually bought you time to stay in the envelope. It, it didn't it was, help it was anything a trade. else. Yeah. The, the, with the engine stuck at idle thrust or zero thrust, whatever you want to call it, because it was spinning. It was, it was, it was burning fuel, um, but it's giving us no thrust. So that can be uh, the... Um, the exhaust nozzle, because um, an engine like that, throughout its different speed and temperature range, it mass flow is how you get thrust. So getting those hot gases to exit at the highest possible velocity while maintaining the parameters of the metallurgy inside the engine to not exceed things, that's how you produce your thrust when you're not an afterburner. And so whether it was the, the turkey feathers, as some people call them, the nozzle being stuck open, um, or whether it was uh, like Jim Brown had uh, in the exact same airplane um, a fuel control issue or they think it was a fuel control issue um, where the engine is stuck at idle um, the procedure for that would be to shut it down and do an air start and the amount of altitude you need for that so that's not an option yeah. so we, we've cashed it in and either by a miracle it's going to come roaring back and maybe we can bottom it out maybe um, but it, at that point with the sink rate the, the decision point is the airplane is crashing and this is going to be a fatal accident and I'm going to be in it. Or I can use this opportunity, use the seat, the, the last opportunity, and bet everything on it. And I put all my eggs in, in that one basket. We had one last card left to play and we got lucky and we came up aces yeah. because the seat functioned. But we were relying on every automatic function of that seat to work perfectly for both of us. And, and we got lucky and it did. It did. Right? However, if we wait to you know, a second or two longer. Then it went from a fatal accident with the crash of the aircraft with us in it to a fatal accident where we are 150 feet away, but still in our seat when we impact the ground, trees, whatever it might be. Which happened recently in the Air Force. Yeah. They had a recent accident in T-38s where that happened. Mm -hmm. So it's all about timing. And uh, that's what I want to talk about is, is the envelope here uh, where all these decisions were made. Um, so. Uh, when I read this, talk about Jim Brown. Um, so he's the guy that actually helped the owner um, ferry the airplane and did his initial training and test flying of the MiG-23 because uh, he was experienced in the airplane. He's from the National Test Pilot School. I'm going to leave a link below to that video with uh, a link directly to the, the time on the video where he's talking about the problem they had in a simulated flameout where the engine bolted back to idle and uh, we could not recover and they had to start, shut it down and start it again. So that in-flight restart, okay, is what I, I think is important to talk about right here because I think that's what the owner, what the pilot was trying to do. 
he's trying, well, I'm going to get it restarted because it happened to me before. Mm -hmm. So I could get it restarted. And if you really read the prelim, prelim report, he says, uh, the ejection happened, I wasn't ready. Uh, uh, yeah, I believe that. You weren't ready because you were trying to do something else, but you weren't paying attention to the situational awareness aspect of this, mm -hmm. is where are you and how much energy do you have? So this is the MiG-23 manual that comes from the National Test Pilot School, and uh, it talks about that. I want to talk a few, a few important things here. Um, so the air start envelope for that engine is, um, it says, it's like 400 to 325 knot, uh, knots. Mm -hmm. So you need that speed to get enough pressure to, to keep the... Uh... And, and that's with using oxygen feed to get it restarted. Mm -hmm. And so you guys were never over 325. No, I wouldn't expect we were at all. So no. you were not even in the air, air start envelope. Correct, yeah, not, not for an air start. No. No, no. so um, you can do a... Uh, the, the manual engine start, it's still an in-flight start. You still need that stuff, but you get the ignition on, all this other stuff. And they say that if it works, you get it, it takes 20 seconds. 20 seconds for a successful start. Uh, you can't do anything until that happens. Mm -hmm. So what is 20 seconds at, say, even generously 2,000 feet per minute? That's going to take you 670 feet, I think, in that range. Sure. From... I run that whole 20 second scenario. Now, uh, now I can throw the engine into mill power uh, and, and see if we can fly. Mm -hmm. Accelerate to fly because I'm at stalling speed anyway. Mm -hmm. Which inertia wise, you really will need more altitude and I'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, but 20 seconds to do that. So in other words, you didn't have it. You didn't have it. It was not an and, option. And the engine, you have to shut the engine down to then do that. Which takes time. Correct, and, but and the engine was still yeah, burning still fuel running. and running. Yeah, so you still have to shut it down. So according to the dash one, it says, the last engine start attempt should be made at an altitude of not less than about 9,000 feet. 9,000, yeah. not 700, Correct. 600 feet. Uh, and it says, if the engine fails to start at an, uh, at an altitude of not less than 6,500 feet, AGL, make an ejection decision or proceed toward the execution of a flame out of a landing. The flame out landing, by the way, basically requires you to be at 250 knots. Correct, and, and at 16,000 feet. Started at 16,000. Above the ground, and, AGL. Yeah, and a base turn at around 9,000 Over feet. the top of the field. Yeah. So, and it's a descending spiral. Low key at about 9,000 feet, mm -hmm. a descending spiral. So uh, you're descending like crazy. Um, and the other thing it says during an in-flight engine start is do not decrease airspeed below 270 knots. Correct. Do You're way below that. You're below this, 200. Yeah, this, this airplane with a clean wing without flaps, you do not want to get slow like that. Yeah. So here's, here's the other thing in, inside that caution note for it says if during the climb, uh, the air jet talks what you want to do is just try to, try to climb a little bit and then do this descent to start. But air, if the airspeed de decreases, to 300 knots at an altitude of 3,300 feet or below, or descending to an altitude of 1,000 meters, abandon further, which is 3,000-ish feet, abandon further start attempts and eject. So you were beyond that. Yeah. You were in the ejection section mm -hmm. already. Correct. And uh, that, was the, that was the option uh, where you had to do that. Um, there's other notes here, I think, that are very pertinent. Um, And uh, basically, during the whole, the whole, um, it, the whole routine is the SFO. You need to be over 250 knots, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately, you guys weren't there. So, as far as being out of the envelope and not, not, uh, uh, you, 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 were, you successfully ejected at the very bottom end of that envelope. And, you, and, and we were and lucky survived. because we were relying on every automatic system above yeah. 2,000 feet. The idea is that if an automatic system doesn't work, like man seat separation, right. those kinds of things, I have an override, I can get to it. I can become oriented from being disoriented from the ejection. I can become oriented, remember it, activate it, man seat separation, get a good shoot, and still have time to be under the shoot before I hit trees or obstacles down or a lake in this case. Yeah. So that's of the lessons learned, the, the delayed decision 
to use the seats. The uh, I wish I'd been wearing LPUs, a life preserver unit. I yeah. when we flew with the Marines in the morning, they were wearing this collar horse that comes on a horse collar yeah. that when it's exposed to water, it automatically inflates. You can be unconscious, and it keeps, and I your, think head it above keeps your head above water, so you can breathe, yeah. so that you don't drown right there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm afraid of swim. You know, I, mm -hmm. I can't swim very far, so I don't like water unless because I can't swim very far. So mm -hmm. if I don't, if if I'm flying over water, I want a horse collar. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and the, those Marines are, are based in Yuma. I don't think they fly over a lot of water, but it's a good policy. Yeah, we it always It makes flew. sense. There's a reason why they do it that way, and they are professionals. And so it just, there's a lot we can learn. There's so much we can learn. So, Mark, I got to tell you that, uh, you know, I talked about it before. Uh, it's a fantastic story, and we're really glad you're here. Um, but I talked about it before, is uh, the, uh, the decision to make that, uh, ejection um, was at the bottom of the envelope. That's too long. It's, you know, even if you looked at it with all the checklist and the dash one stuff that we looked at for the MiG-23 and the reference of what we did in the Air Force at 2,000 feet, there's no reason to, <laughs> to delay an ejection below 2,000 feet. You guys were already there, and in my opinion, you waited too long. Yeah, I understand. Lessons learned. So, anyway, incredible story. Um, there's a lot of lessons learned here. And, and there will be more. I look forward to the yeah. investigation and, and understanding a little bit more of why the engine was stuck uh, in, a, in a zero thrust. And that's interesting stuff, but that's not survival stuff. Correct. Okay. Correct. So just to say that. But thanks for coming and sharing this. I know it's a, kind of an emotional wrench. Thank you, Scott. It is. It's, it. it's heavy and it's, uh, it's exhausting for me to tell. That's really awesome to have you here talking to me. Thank you. Because you're a good friend. I appreciate it. And I like talking with you <laughs> and flying with you. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the story. And uh, more to come as uh, things, as events unfold. Yep. We'll talk about it again. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Scott. See you next time on Flywire.